We are studying the book of James this quarter to go along with our theme of striving together side by side for this year. Um, selected the book of James, which is called the Proverbs of the New Testament, the Gospel of Common Sense, um, among other things. It's pretty practical teaching. And really our sub-theme for this quarter is uh, striving side by side when it comes to our conduct. And so our focus this quarter as a congregation is on our conduct. And so that's why in the sermon series we're starting to talk about the fruit of the Spirit and how it guides our conduct and walking in the Spirit. And as we study the book of James, uh, you're going to see a lot of practical lessons that deal with our conduct as well. So um, that's why our focus is there. Um, that's why Craig is teaching about denying ourselves on Sunday morning as well. It kind of goes along with our our theme. So while you're turning there, and um, if you didn't get a lesson yet, they're on the back uh, table as well as on the handout. I'm not sure what you call that thing, actually. That's in the lobby, but they're back there if you need one. And next week's lesson are, is on the table as well. Uh, let's start with the prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are so grateful as we come before you for uh, your love and for your mercy. We're so grateful that you've given us this day. We're thankful um, that we've been able to get through today and to come here together and to be with people who can encourage us in our faith, uh, that we've come together to look at your word, to be strengthened by it. We pray that we've come with honest hearts and that we're willing to take what we hear to apply it to our lives and to put it to use every day as we try to serve you. We pray, Lord, for those who can't be here today, for those who are sick. um, We pray that you'll you'll be with them, that you'll strengthen them. We pray, especially at this time, for for Brother Jack White. He's struggling and his health is fading and his days are, are short and few. And we pray that you'll be with his wife and his family. We pray that we'll be encouragers to them. Uh, We pray that we'll do what we can to um, give him hope, to remember his hope and um, his strength is truly in you. And that there's so many greater things waiting for him and waiting for each of us as we strive to serve you, as we try to live for something beyond this life. Uh, We pray, Lord, at this time as we study your word that that we'll teach it in a way that's honest and appropriate and tactful. And we pray that as hearers will apply it. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity again. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Taking a look at the book of James today. When I study a text, I really like to do some background information. Kind of right when we get into it. Um, and then we'll kind of get into the questions a little bit more. The first question that was in your um, on your sheet, um, actually kind of points to some of that background information that we want to touch upon for just a moment before we get into the topic, which is just thinking about trials, thinking about testing, thinking about temptation, which James chapter 1, really the first um, 17 verses, I think that's one of the, that's the main focus Um, But let's take a look at a few things as we think about the right approach to trials and temptations. The first question there was, who wrote this letter? Well, you might say, well, that was James. But I think what we're getting at is which James? Um, Because there's a little bit of a discussion about that. There are really three, I guess you would say, main Jameses, if you will, in the scriptures. There's James, the son of Zebedee. He's mentioned in Matthew chapter 4. He was the brother of John. John and James were brothers, and they were called by Jesus the sons of thunder. They were a little bit temperamental in a, in a couple of occasions. You remember in Luke chapter 9, they wanted to call down fire upon the Samaritan village that didn't want to hear their teaching. So they were a bit fiery. Um, but that James was killed by Herod in 44 AD. You read about that in Acts chapter 12. So this book couldn't have been written by James, the son of Zebedee. Um, There's also James, the son of Alphaeus, who's one of the apostles. You find him listed in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 3. We don't really know a whole lot about him, um, other than he's mentioned as an apostle. But it's doubtful that he wrote um, James. Uh, But then there's James, the brother of 
Jesus. Uh, we know that Jesus had brothers, right? Because we read Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 and 56 there. You're going to find that the brothers and even the sisters of Jesus are referred to in that passage. It says in verse 55, Is this not the carpenter's son, speaking of Jesus? Is not his mother called Mary, his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? His sisters, are they not all with us? Verse 56 says. And so Jesus had brothers, he had sisters. Um, and it's noted in 1 Corinthians 9 that uh, James was one of those brothers of Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5, Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? And so those brothers are mentioned, brothers to the Lord, brothers to Jesus. Um, James was an unbeliever, though, during Christ's ministry. You read about their unbelief in passages like Mark 3, John 7. But we find he became a believer after the resurrection. When you get to Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, you find that James is there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. In that crowd uh, with the apostles, it says in verse 14 that these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And James is specifically mentioned, his name mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7. He's even called a pillar of the church in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9. Um, so, James here, the author of the, the book that we're studying, is the brother of Jesus Christ. I want to mention something to you about James that we learn not from Scripture, but we learn from historical writings. And this is according to Hegesippus. Now, he's quoted in Eusebius's Ecclesiastical Histories. Eusebius is called the father of church history. And you can read a lot of interesting history from Eusebius about various Bible characters and then beyond. But it says this, which I thought was interesting. He, that's James he's referring to here, was in the habit of entering the temple alone and was often found upon his bended knees and interceding for the forgiveness of the people so that his knees became as hard as camels in consequence of his habitual supplication and kneeling before God. And indeed, on account of his exceeding great piety, he was called the just, James the just. Uh, I thought that was pretty awesome, uh, the idea that this guy prayed so much, his knees were as hard as camels. Um, and so James has a very positive reputation, um, not just from the short excerpts we read uh, about him here in Scripture, and certainly by his writing, but in extra-biblical history as well. So this is the James that we're reading from, the James that was constantly in prayer. The James who in chapter 5 is going to encourage people, if you're suffering, pray. And who says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James believed in what he wrote, and he practiced it when we read about him in history. And so I find that kind of interesting. I want you to notice something. Um, and that is, you'll find in the book of James a lot of things that he writes that, that just sound very reminiscent of Jesus. That makes sense, right? If he grew up with Jesus, um, if he heard Jesus, whether he was a believer or not, if he heard Jesus, a lot of it must have been soaking in. And we find a lot of similarities be, 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 uh, in comparison to what Jesus taught and in what James writes. For example, in Matthew 5, Jesus is teaching, Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name. And then here in James 1 and verse 2 that we're going to look at in just a moment, he says, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into various trials. That sounds very similar to what Jesus taught. In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 48, we'll just look at a few of these passages. You're just going to notice a lot of uh, similarities, and there may be more that you notice that just kind of pop out to you, but it says, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And then we read James chapter 1 and verse 4, and here's James talking about that you may be perfect, and if perfect is mature, complete, lacking in nothing. And just as Jesus talked about becoming more mature and more complete 
as followers of God. James spoke of it as well. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. And in James 1 and verse 5, James says, if you lack wisdom, ask. Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. Matthew 7 and verse 21, you you find just more things, more references um, <clears throat> that we could just go through. And in, in, in the writing of James, you, you really see the words of Jesus echoed, I think, in his writing. Uh, we could look at a lot more of those, but I just wanted to kind of point that out to you. What's interesting to me is that even though James is the brother of Jesus, he doesn't address himself that way as he starts out his, his writing. He doesn't say, I'm James, the brother of Jesus. He says, I'm James, the servant of Jesus, which is a word that servant, I think, doles down a little bit. Um, the, the word slave would be a better translation. I'm James, and, and Jesus might be my brother, but I'm his slave. He's my master. Um, and that's how he begins his writing as he speaks of his role and his relationship with Jesus. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus. And he's writing this as a servant to encourage other servants of the Lord Jesus as well. Um, and so James is the author. We learn a little bit about James for some of that. Um, take a look at this chart here and you'll find the time of writing for James. James is one of the earliest New Testament books. And I, I, I like to point that out just because when we read our New Testament, sometimes we assume that you know, maybe they're in chronological order. They're not. Um, sometimes we assume the earlier we find them in our New Testaments, the earlier they were written. That's not true. Um, James was likely written between 45 and 60 A.D. And we know part of that uh, just based upon uh, <clears throat> some, some details in the book of, of James and other places. But that's the general time frame of the date of this composition. And he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Um, who would that be? Who are these 12 tribes which are scattered abroad? You think that's the literal nation of Israel? What are we, what are we talking about when he says that? Well, when you say 12 tribes, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's Jews. You think it refers to Jews? Um, well, when, if it refers to Jews, my next question would be, then, are these Jews that have converted to Christianity? Yeah, Art? <clears throat> this is written uh, after these were Christians. So it was written after... Let's see how long it uh, This is written after the death of Jesus. The church would have been already established. Absolutely, yeah. The church would have been established. He refers to Jesus as the Lord. So these aren't Jews who reject the Lord. Um, if, if we are talking about Jews, we're talking about Jews who have converted to Christianity. Um, he says in verse 2, my brethren, and he uses that phrase brethren over and over again. So these are, these are Christians that he's writing to, whether they be Jewish Christians, Christians only, um, Jews who had converted to Christianity is, is a little bit up for debate. But um, the term 12 tribes most clearly does point usually to the people of Israel, points to the Jewish nation. Um, Acts 26 and verse 7, Paul uses it in that way um, as he's speaking. Um, but th these Jews would have become Christians. And many of them, of course, did become Christians in the early days of the church, right? You read in Acts chapter 2 that there were people on the day of Pentecost from all nations who came there who heard Peter's sermon. You read in Acts chapter 8 that some of those people who started in the Jerusalem church after the persecution that Saul was involved in, they were scattered abroad. And so here it says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So many of those Jews would have been, they would have gone to their places, many of them, after Pentecost, and then those that stayed in Jerusalem would have been scattered because of the persecution um, as well in Acts chapter 8. And they would have um, uh, taken part in, and uh, been involved in, in starting and beginning local congregations as they spread abroad. Now, as you think about that, um, 
Another question we might ask, and, and keep in mind as well, the term 12 tribes, the term Israel, the term Jew, it's used in a very figurative sense as well in Scripture. Romans chapter 2 and verse 28 and 29. Take a look at a couple of these. So there is the possibility we could be speaking figuratively as we look at that term. It says in verse 28, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And Paul also in chapter 4 speaks of those being the, of the people of God, the Israel of God, who are both circumcised and uncircumcised. So we could call, we could say that we're talking about Jews who converted to Christianity, or we could be just using an early reference uh, to Jews and Gentiles. But clearly, we want to point out that these are Christians, and these are Christians that are scattered. Now, being scattered, being separated... Uh, being Christians who are just kind of all over the place, who maybe have been persecuted, who are trying to live out their faith in perhaps either in the face of persecution or in pagan lands, in, in, in pagan areas. What are some of the trials that some of these first converts, if they were converts from Judaism to Christianity or just uh, Gentile converts or both, what are some of the trials that they would have faced as they lived out their faith. Merit? Well, if they were among those that were scattered when you've been displaced, so you probably left a city or a place familiar to you. Um, the Romans are in, in control of things. They're very much pagan. The, the fellow Jews that you used to knew uh, probably have ostracized you in a lot of ways. And so your, your life's not looking very good right now. Uh, Physically. Okay, good point. Ostracism, uh, so separation, you're discouraged because of that. Um, Seth? Well, if, if they're out amongst pagan people, the temptations that they might not have had, even among their, when they were of the Jewish faith, if they were with other Jews, they might not have some of the temptations you'd find in some of the pagan lands. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So you've got um, temptations just to be like the Romans around them, uh, worldliness. You would say maybe, Kevin? Economically, it might have hurt them if they were trying to run a business or something. People might shun them or it might be it would just be difficult to get a job or to run a business. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you build a life somewhere and then you're sent away from that area, you, there's a good chance you're going to face financial hardship trying to restart. And then you're trying to restart in an area maybe where people don't want to have Christians doing work for them. Um, they look upon you suspiciously. Um, that was certainly true in, in Roman lands too, right? Where there were Christians who, um, they were being boycotted by a lot of the, a lot of the unions, a lot of the, the trade guilds. Um, you read, you study Revelation, you read a lot about, uh, about that as well. Nathan, do you have a hand up? Yeah, I was going to say, kind of what Seth said, you know, think about today, you know, people go to some place that's strange or new. You're thinking, how can I fit in? You know, if you're a Christian and Rome is ruling and you're someplace new, how am I going to fit into this place? But, you know, they really let their faith shine in, in the face of persecution and preaching God's word. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good point. I saw some other hands. Craig? It's possible they could be facing some things internally as well. I mean, they've converted from Judaism to, to being Christian. And, you know, the people of God were Jews before, and there was this way that God told them to behave and to, and to live. And now they've changed that. And they're trying to go from the physical to the spiritual. And understanding that, you know, when he talks about faith and works in the next chapter, in chapter 2. So that may have been some, there may have been some challenges there about which way to go, what's right, what's... To God. Mm -hmm. This is in the early days of Christianity. These people are babes in Christ, too, in a, in a big sense. They, they need to mature. So I think that's a good point. Paul? Yeah, I was just going to say that... <coughs> excuse me. Um, they would undertake a lot of strife. Mm -hmm. Just by being... Even though they were scattered and set abroad, there was still a lot of 
Old Testament Jews that they had to deal with, Pharisees, Sadducees, continually. So they would be under constant persecution and strife from the constant victory and, mm-hmm. you know, you're wrong and, and this is the old way, this is the right way. And, mm-hmm. I mean, they would just consider having constant pressure. Good point. Uh, you know, something else I thought about, um, you talk about the fact this is one of the earliest books in the New Testament. Right? So mm-hmm. we have the advantage today of being able to read all of the guidance and the wisdom and the insight and the God breathed scriptural authority that Paul had, right? This was before Paul. Mm-hmm. Right? So this was this was when when Saul was still persecuting, you know, so they didn't have the ability to, to read the epistles and say, We're doing something wrong. Right? So I mean you you look at the the denominational world that we live in today where people have Strife, even within you know people who want to all claim the name of Jesus, they have strife over certain things, baptism or no baptism, right? Uh, what what do we do for you know these, these are folks that that he's writing to that are uh, eight ten years after Christ has been crucified, mm-hmm. so there there's not a lot of documentation, there's not a lot of, of God breathed assistance to help them understand what it is they're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, James is talking to folks that are, I, I don't want to use the term winging it, but they're talking to folks that have heard and have believed and have been baptized, but maybe aren't doing things all the way they're supposed to do, and they're trying to figure things out. And that's, that's a trial in and of itself. Good lesson for us too, right? Uh, sometimes people just need teaching. There are people that are babes in Christ, and even if they've been Christians for 8 to 10 years, they still need teaching. They still need to mature. And um, James is attempting to do that. I just think if you look through the pages of James, you, you can see all of the um, all of the evidences of, of a, a group of people who were immature in their faith in a lot of ways. Um, and they needed a lot more teaching. A lot of them weren't applying it to their lives. So you read about that in James chapter 1. A lot of them were perhaps tempted to give up and, and use their persecution as an excuse to quit. And so he encourages them to endure. Some of them have temptations that they're dealing with on the inside. And he encourages them not to give in to those temptations. There was a famine that we read about in the book of Acts, right? And that famine would have led, um, it would have caused a lot of need in the early church. And so we read about helping out the fatherless and helping out um, <clears throat> the widows. And we see that was a big emphasis of Paul, of course, during a lot of his journeys. You read about that in James 1. James 2, there's this, uh, there's this desire to be partial to the rich and to kind of neglect the poor. Um, and to maybe favor the rich more than they did the poor. And so that's dealt with. James 3, if, you have, if you're being persecuted, if people are looking down upon you because you're poor... Uh, are you tempted to use your tongue maybe in a, in a way that's, that's not quite right? To speak in bitterness, to speak resentfully? So James 3, there's this focus on the tongue and using your tongue in a way that brings peace to situations and not, not strife. And then you look at James 4 and there's, he deals with word, worldliness. He deals with you are seeking uh, after worldly things and worldly pleasures. And he encourages them not to be friends with the world because you'll become an enemy of God. So we see the Roman influence that um, maybe was mentioned there um, plaguing this group of people. Um, He talks about speaking evil of your brother. He talks about not hoarding riches. He talks about not grumbling about each other. Um, And so over and over again, he he just addresses various problems that we're going to go through this quarter and try to to take a look at as well. Problems that were... uh, Somewhat because they had been scattered. Problems that were just problems because they were new converts and and establishing themselves as local congregations. Um, So let's take a look at a couple of quotes here. This is from Warren Wearsby. He says this. Um, I I like reading from Wearsby, but I I warn you from the very start when you read Wearsby that he believes in faith only, so he's going to be... He's dead wrong on James 2 and in other places. But he, he makes some really good practical points when you're talking about moral 
teaching uh, that I like. As we review this list of problems, and he's listed many of the things I just noted, does it appear to be much different from the problems that beset the average local church today? Do we have tongue problems? Do we have worldliness problems? Um, do, do we have grumbling problems? Do we have temptation problems? Do we have favoritism problems? Um, do we have people who aren't quick to sing, aren't quick to turn to prayer in time of need? This book is just as applicable today as it was when James first wrote it. And so he says, Do we not have members who talk one way but walk another way? Is not worldliness a serious problem? Are there not Christians who cannot control their tongues? It seems that James was dealing with very up-to-date matters. All of these problems had a common cause, spiritual immaturity. And so when we read verse 4, it says, Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, that you may be mature. This is an immature church. And so one of the whole purposes of this writing is really summarized in these first few verses. And that I want you to endure the trials. And he's going to write about a whole bunch of trials throughout the rest of the book. Because I want you to learn to be a more mature Christian and a more mature church. Um, Take a look at Guy Woods. He writes this in his commentary. These to whom James wrote were in frequent contact with the rich and arrogant countrymen who continually oppressed and persecuted them, and their trials were thus exceedingly burdensome and painful to bear. It was not always easy to exhibit patience and forbearance in such trying situations, and a large measure of Christian endurance and love was necessary in order properly to live the Christian life. The letter, that's the letter that James writes here, because of its eminently practical character has been quite properly styled the gospel of common sense. It is a wonderful demonstration of the fact that the principles of Christ, properly applied and fully assimilated, will adequately meet the needs of every generation, whatever the period in history may be. And so this is good for us to study. It's going to apply to to certain life situations that we face um, as Christians today. Here's the first four verses of James. It says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes in the dispersion. That's how the English Standard Version phrases it. Greetings. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, question. How do we typically view trials? It's a bad thing. Right. Right. Uh, is, is that the general approach we have? You know, you face a trial, you, your car runs out of gas. I'm really happy about that. Right. Count it all joy. I can't wait to walk down the highway and flag somebody down. Um, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We don't usually see trials as something that's a good thing. Uh, you have conflict in the church. You, you don't usually view that as a, a joyous thing, a, a positive thing. Um, conflict in your marriage, trials um, when, you're, when it comes to parenting. Uh, we don't always view those things as, as positive. Trials at work. You, know, you lose your job. You, you face some type of sickness when it comes to your health. Um, we don't usually view them very positively. But... but James writes, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How do we do that? In what ways might a person find joy? Uh, I think that in some ways, um, it's the path you're supposed to take. It's it's what's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. What are you learning from it? Right, we can learn something from it. I think that's a good good point. Dwayne? You know, we've got an expression in English, uh, forged in fire. So you, you take this raw material, whatever it might be, and you heat it up and you beat it, and it turns into something better, right? And then the Bible uses the idea of iron sharpening iron, right? And so life is life. You know, part of part of the problem that we have is we're going to face disease and sickness and death and all kinds of other trials. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think what what James is trying to say is. And we don't just roll over and die when a trial comes. You know, we realize that that we're we're being—I want to use the term tested—but we're being hardened. We're being 
made to understand. You know, for me, a lot of times when I look at the trials, I say, you know what? <coughs> yeah, things stink right now. I hurt. I don't feel good. But I, I know in the end, when I get through this life, if I can continue to go the way I'm, where, where my destination is, there's no, there's no sickness, there's no sorrow, there's no sadness, there's no pain. So this is this is temporary, yeah, yeah. right? And so it, it puts into focus, um, yeah, what it is that we're really looking for. And we, we can be here for 60 years and, and have pain and sickness, but when that 60 years is over, we're somewhere else eternal, mm-hmm. and it's not going to be there anymore. And so that that's to me a great way to you know, change the, my way of thinking to, to, to understand what it is that, that I work for, what it is that, that we're trying to strive for. It's mm-hmm. something beyond what I would even consider joy. Yeah, yeah. So it helps us focus on the eternal. It's one thing um, that we can find joy in trials knowing that it's going to be really nice when we get to a place where we don't have to deal with some of these things, right? Now let's take that, let's apply it to, to personal situation. All right? You have Jack White right now, who he's he's dying. He's hospice has been called in. Um, he doesn't have much longer uh, to live. He's getting weaker and weaker. Um, how can we tell Jack while you're facing this trial that there's actually there's some joy here, and I, I think one of the ways we do that is to do exactly what Dwayne mentioned. That, Jack, you might just be the, the luckiest person in this, entire, in this entire church right now because pretty soon you're going to be with God, and you're going to be there eternally, and you're not going to have to deal with cancer or chemotherapy or cemeteries anymore and sickness and dying there's there's some some joy there and you know i I sat with i was with jack yesterday for a while and one of the things that i was able to do with him with his son and his and his daughter and his family there is is to say that you know i'm so glad you made the decision to get baptized in a christ a year ago because you've got hope and a resurrection now And, and i hope everybody can can learn from you and have that hope. I hope we can see some joy um, through through the suffering. You had a hand up, Barbara. I, I I I hear what you're saying because I've been to that experience not long ago with my brother. But in this day to day time called life, I have learned. I can't remember. I've been sitting here trying to think of the author of the book, Practicing the Presence. And in reading that book, <coughs> what it taught me was because what I believe that the Lord does in my life at all times uh, when trials and tribulations come, it's easy to forget that. So I began to practice remembering Him in the midst of the trials. And it would be so easy to go left, but I practice going right. And it takes time to do that, and I've been doing that for years. And my mother used to say to me, she said, uh, and my mother was a uh, Christian inside out. She said, I marvel at how you think. I said, I practice how to think this way. I said, it it doesn't just come naturally. But in my brother's death, the doctor asked him, well, do you have a living will? He said, I do. And he said, "Uh, well, do you want to? He said, let's just make this clear. He said, I'm not afraid of death. He said, I'm ready for death. He said, so don't prolong it when the time comes. Now that's easy to say. It's easy for me to say how positive I am in the midst of trials. But he believed that. And it was so wonderful to hear him say that because I said, Jack, I feel the same way. I said, now I'm not all that. But I practice that because God is. And because he is, I am. So in the midst of trial, I have nothing to do. You know, there's my grandmother who said, just get right up in the Lord's face, just like I'm in your face right now. <laughs> just get right up in his face and tell him what it is you need. I do that quite often. And often I think the Lord says, you know, are you going to do anything on your own? <laughs> and the answer to that is no. Because he told me I did not have to. And so that's just a practice thing for me in everyday life. Knowing that the end is where Jack quite is going to be and a lot of people get to that point and don't feel that comfort 
Mm-hmm. So you have to practice, I think, to get to that level yeah. of comfort. I think you make a good point. That is, our mindset is what needs to be fixed first. And that's why it says, count it all joy. Outlook helps determine outcome. And so if we start with the right outlook as we face trials, and we can realize that God can make something good come out of the trials, then the outcome can become positive for us as well. Um, Go ahead. Uh, My father, when he was passing away, he had no problem with it because he was Christian, and he was preaching a sermon. I got him on my phone, recorded him. Um, and he was just, his mind was with it to the end. He died on a Sunday, and my daughter got to sit with him, and she piped in a sermon because she wanted to be in church with him one more time. He couldn't go because he was on 15 liters of oxygen, so he couldn't carry two or three big machines. You know? mm-hmm. But um, And he passed away as soon as someone said a prayer. They came up for services and said a prayer, and he they walked out and he died. Everything was complete and he was preaching to us, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Guys, we're gonna make it through like three verses and it's gonna take us three years to get through James at this rate. Dwight, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> One thing when you face trials and you overcome those, you gain new strength to go forward when you're facing something maybe even stronger. But each time that you face these trials and you go over them, it just gives you, builds you new strength to achieve more. Produces steadfastness, the text says. Produces steadfastness. You, get, you go through one trial and you conquer it. It helps you to realize you can go through it again and you could even go through more. Um, we, we learned that from exercise, right? And this is spiritual exercise that James is, is dealing with. That when you face certain trials and overcome them, you can overcome more. Um, and so, those would be some of the positive results of a tested faith. Um, it causes us to think about our hope. It, it causes us to endure. Um, it purifies us. We learn something from it. You know, you, even the gas can example, right? You learn something when you don't check your gas gauge. <laughs> you start having to walk with that gas can, right? You, you learn something from trials. And I think when we're in the midst of trials, that needs to be a question that we consider. What, what can I learn from this? Um, how can I grow from this? Um, whether it be a conflict with others or just some personal problem, whatever it is. Uh, and, and if we learn something from it, if we grow from it, if it can cause us to to build our trust in God and God's ways rather than our own ways, then then we can find joy in the midst of trials. Uh, Let's take a look at verses 5 through 8. What do we do when we are facing trials and we don't know exactly how to handle it? Um, How we can see the joy in it, the, the silver lining, if you will. Well, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, God's not going to rebuke you for asking him. That's the idea. God's not going to be upset that you bothered him with your requests. God gives to all liberally without reproach. It will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Why might a person not receive an answer to the request for wisdom from God? What's the text say? We always receive an answer. It's just not always the one we want. Hmm. And sometimes a no answer is the right answer, whether, whether we want to accept it or not, right? The text says not to be double minded, right? Dwayne? I was just going to say, it says if you lack wisdom, if you don't ask in faith, if you're doubting, you know, all of those things are double minded. You can just kind of read through there. Mm-hmm. And you know, James is saying when you pray, don't do these things. You know, lack wisdom, don't, mm-hmm. don't doubt. What's it? It compares a double minded man to a wave of the sea. What is a wave of the sea like? Is it predictable? 
No, and you, you, one second the sea can be ten feet out, and next one it's knocking you down. Right? It's not predictable. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. Double-minded man is somebody who's he's all for God one minute, and then he's not trusting God the next minute. He's up and down. He's in an emotional and spiritual roller coaster. This text says, be the type of person who realizes the power of God and have confidence as you pray. And again, I go back to what we quoted at the very beginning about James, a guy who prayed so much that history tells us his knees were like camel's knees because he was on the ground praying so fervently. He truly believed in the power of prayer, and he's teaching it here. Jeff. It's saying, you know, you become double-minded and unstable and, you know, you're asking God for wisdom on one side, and then on the other side, you're saying, well, what is wisdom? So, if you don't even know what you're asking for, of course you're going to be unstable. And you have to, like you said, you have to have faith and believe in what you're asking for for God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Craig? Well, James just repeats what we know of Jesus when we read through the Gospels. And he tells his disciples the importance of asking for things and believing and having faith because that God can accomplish those things. Different places where he tells them that with God nothing is impossible. Um, even when some came and asked for a healing and, and said to him, you know, if you can do this, and he responded, you know, if I can, you know, and it showed that he absolutely uh, unequivocally can. So when James shows us the importance of having confidence in what God can do. Um, having the right heart and asking the right way is helps us get what God has promised to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Let's take a look at this next section. James 1, 9 through 12. Hopefully we can at least finish this, these 12 verses up. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, withers the grass, its flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Um, We're going to focus on rich poor when we get to chapter 2 especially and so we're not going to spend as much time on this particular section here but clearly there were some lowly brothers who were in a a better situation when it came to the church I, I like one phrase that I read in the church there's no caste systems right there's no the rich people are favored more than than the poor people and so James says, all right, if you're, if you're poor and if you're lowly, let him boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Maybe somebody was rich but lost money. Maybe as a result of their faith and persecution, they've lost money. But he says that actually can be a positive thing for you. Here's James trying to help the rich person see the joy in this situation. He says, let the rich boast in his humiliation, glory in his humiliation. And here's why. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. He needs to learn something from this experience that just like he's lost his money, one day he's going to lose his life. And he's not going to be here forever. And this can be a learning experience for him. Um, He tends to turn his focus not on the temporal things and possessions, but as Dwayne mentioned, on the eternal riches. James says, here's why you, if, if you've been persecuted and you've lost money and possessions and lands and things and even family and you've been ostracized, here's why you can view that as positive because God's got something greater for you. And then he ends with what we read in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. God's got something greater for you than anything here on this earth. Um, If you love him, he knows you, and he's going to bless you. And so James is encouraging those who are suffering persecution and trials to keep their focus on the right thing. Outlook determines outcome. Thanks for your attention. We'll look at uh, the latter part of James next week.